Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of TVT Pod. Actually, this is the last episode of TVT Pod for this season. Although I'm not excited, I'm excited too because it's been a long season. I'm also happy to have my guest today. Remember, this podcast is proudly sponsored by my faves, Lip Team. Today, my guest is someone who I regard as one of the most brilliant minds in PR and comms in Nigeria. Having worked with her for over a year, I can tell you that she gave me some of the necessary tools to be who I am today. And I'm more than happy to have her spill some tea about her journey on the couch. Please put your hands together for my guest, Elizabeth Oshaw of Somi Solutions. Hello, my madam. I, I thought you were going to not put my madam. Ah! I was going to tell you that until the end. I'm still going to be <laughs> yes, looking so for my, my madam. madam. Yes, so. Oh my God, it's so good to have you it's on the couch. It's good to finally be on your couch, Tay. It's a full circle moment. It is. Look at that. I'm proud of you. Thank I'm you very, so very much. proud Thank of you. you so I do much. tell you. It means and a I know lot you to know. me. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Welcome on, on the show. Um, I've been looking forward to this episode. In fact, I was supposed to have finished earlier. I said, you know what, I'm going to wait for Liz Osho so we can talk about what she's up to and the book and everything. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for waiting for me. I'm good. You know, obviously not in Lagos full time anymore. Mm -hmm. So just having to do a lot of traveling. Yeah, I see that. But mm -hmm. also the brand is moving and I can see that, you know, you not being in Lagos is intentional. Like you're spreading the... The seeds we're growing. And we're is growing. growing. We're growing. The team is literally now in Abuja, mm -hmm. um, also DC. Um, okay. Yeah, we have. She's international. Uh, American clients. And, yeah. You know, we're just trying to, we're trying to do God's work. You know, mm. we're trying to tell people's stories, um, and yeah, I'm intentional about that. You know, I'm so proud of you. Like as much as you're proud of me, I'm proud of you because I remember the that small cubicle in Idejo Street. <laughs> <laughs> and when Liz got that office, Liz was so proud of herself. I was. VI I location. Was. I was. But look at you now. I'm Girl. so proud. Well mm. done. Well done. Well done. So, you know, this show, as as things they go, we must do background checks to get information about your life and mm -hmm. you know, things that inform the person that you are today. So, let's get into it. Tell me about growing up and mm -hmm. things that informed the Liz or show that we have today. Yeah, so I was born in Lagos. I was mm -hmm. born in Surulere. Hey, Lere. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I moved to England when I was eight, right? right? Um, and I went to boarding school. And it was really interesting because, you know, you don't have a choice when you're eight. You just, it's what your parents do um, that you, you move with. But that, I would say, was one of the most crucial moments in my life. So my parents got divorced when I was really young. Mm -hmm. um, probably before I was three, my parents were no longer together. But it didn't really impact me, you know? It was when I was eight, when I now had to be in a place where no one looked like me. I was the only black girl in the mm -hmm. school that they put me in. That was when I realized that, okay, I'm different. That was when, you know, maybe some of the trauma mm -hmm. that I have so kind of started developing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I was in school for eight years in Dorset, in a, a little town called Dorset, in the southwest of England. And I went to the University of Birmingham, where I studied classical civilization and literature. Mm -hmm. Um, worked in recruitment for about seven, eight years. Then I moved to Nigeria mm. um, in 2012. And so, yeah, that's a little bit of my journey. Yeah. Um, so I'm also interested in, in, the, in the divorce that happened between your parents at three. And, you know, that can inform a child's life. It can make, it can make or break a child at that early age. What did it do to you? So, you know, because I was three, I didn't really you know, understand. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. what it is. You know, maybe when you are, you're used to your parents being together until an age where you remember, you know, maybe then you would say that, okay, this informed me in that way. But I never knew my parents together. You know, all I knew was that I lived with mommy and I would go and visit daddy. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because my dad remarried um, and my stepmother's children, my half sister and half brother, they also did the same thing. Nobody lived with my, my dad. So they also lived somewhere else and we would all meet. I would literally on a Friday be picked up. I went to Lebanese community school mm -hmm. in Yaba. And oh, then they would go school. and, you know the school. Mm -hmm. And then they would go and pick up my sister and brother from their schools. They went to AIS. Mm -hmm. And then we would all go to daddy's house. Mm -hmm. We would all have our backpack for the weekend. Right. So I didn't, I, I just thought that's how people live. You know, especially when you live a sheltered life where I don't go and visit people. I don't spend the night at people's house. So this is my normality, you yeah. know. Um, However, there was something that was very different about my own upbringing, even with the fact that I thought this was normal. It was the fact that I had this stepmother who she seemed to really love me, Tamisa. 
And she, but what she seemed to want to do was separate me from my mom. So she wanted a situation where I choose. And it was very clear early on, you know. And I think that's where the trauma started. So mm -hmm. by as early as five, six, seven, I could tell that she was happiest with me when I seemed to belong to her. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, so it plays with a young child's mind because mm -hmm. you want favor. And I think even this people pleasing so from early. young, <laughs> Girl, from, four years, about it. from four years old, I've had to people please yeah. because I had to please her. Mm -hmm. You know, so I will find myself telling her things like, I don't really want to go home. I want to go home with mm -hmm. my mom. But she was happy to hear that. You know, she'd be like, she see, she doesn't want to tell them again. Oh yeah, tell them. Tell them you don't want to go home now. <laughs> so I, I, would, I would lie, mm -hmm. you know. And so, because I, I was trying to please her, you know. Mm -hmm. So those people pleasing tendencies started from there. I, I, it was messy. I talk a lot about it in my book, mm -hmm. um, but it's stuff that I've had to navigate and had to heal from. Do you remember the relationship that you had with your father? So my dad had some mental health issues. Um, I talk about that in the book as well. Oh so my God, this book, I, I can't wait to grab yeah, it. Yeah, he had some mental health issues, which meant that I couldn't talk to him. <laughs> you know, um, it was... I, I wasn't sure which dad I was going to get from day to day, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it was quite... Again, it's now that I know that that wasn't normal. <laughs> you know, that wasn't, I don't know if normal is the world. It was my reality. Yeah. But it's down that I, that I realized that that wasn't ideal. I think ideal is the, yes. Is yes. the, is the better word. Yeah. Um, but my dad wasn't someone that you could reason with. So it wasn't a situation where I would say things to him. It just what it, it was what it was. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my dad was the only child of his parents. And so he had a really, really... Um, privileged upbringing right. and I think that's what even led to part of him being spoiled he was extremely spoiled mm -hmm. and that meant that this guy got everything that he wanted so my you may you may know I've told Your you this grandma. my grandma no, say for the, for she the was the first that. female doctor in West Africa Ooh. yeah Elizabeth Abimbola Awoli she's from pedigree <laughs> I am named after her um so before she became Awoli and married her husband she was from the famous Akerele family mm -hmm. Negotiations. They're quite yeah. well known in the in the Lagos circles, and my dad was her only surviving child, and so everything was willed to him, and so my father never worked for one day in his life, like never worked because he had all this money, and that money looked after him. He died. At, he died at seventy something, and that money looked after us. What kind of money was there? It was long money. <laughs> it was long. <laughs> that money long, <laughs> you know. So yeah. um, yeah, I talk about it in the book. I talk mm -hmm. about what that meant for him mm -hmm. and actually how it informs my parenting, right. you know, because there's just some things that you just have to avoid as a parent. And that is your child going spoiled. Do you right. understand? Because right. it really, right. really changes the trajectory of their life. And um, even how they treat their kids. That's it. That's it. So mm -hmm. a lot of that was, you know, I talk about generational curses mm -hmm. in the book, you know, and we rebuke it, you know, and how um, a lot of the things that happened to my 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 grandmother is trying to play out with me mm. and what I'm doing to combat that. We're going to get into that. But let's talk about moving to London. So what, what informed the decision to move to London? Because you moved with your mom. So I moved with my dad and my mom. My mom was Were pregnant. Were they still together? They weren't together, but my mom moved and my dad moved too. Okay. So when he moved, he didn't move like to go and live there forever. But my mom lived, she still lives in England. She yeah. moved then and you know settled in England. I had a baby. Um, my brother, mm -hmm. David, but my dad, you know, took us to school. So he had, I had two siblings younger than me. Mm -hmm. And so he took us to school. We, you know, we went for open days. We chose our schools and we started schooling. He had a house in Hampstead. But they didn't live together. So my parents didn't live together. No, my dad had his house in Hampstead. You've been to England now. Yeah. You know where Hampstead is? I don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know where we live. I don't know where we live. So my dad lived in Hampstead yeah. and my mom lived in East London. But they were co-parenting. They were co-parenting. So mm. I would spend half the time with my dad, half the time with my mom. Mm. That's the holidays. But remember, I'm in boarding school. Right. So for three months, I'm in school. Unless it's like an exiat or a half term. Mm -hmm. But I'm in school. And then my actual holidays, which is three times a year, mm -hmm. Easter, summer, Christmas, right. I would half the time, split the time. With and them. that's what I'd always done, even in Nigeria. Mm. Even in Nigeria, my dad lived in Ikoyi. My mom lived in Ikeja. So everybody wonders why I'm so dynamic. Yeah. It's because I've had in both lives. Yeah. I've had both lives. Mm. I can blend in, you know? 
If we go rough, I'm going go rough. I'm I love that. <laughs> but if we need to eat caviar, I'm down with that I as well, darling. It. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> that balance is very important mm -hmm. for a child. Um, I'm also curious about the relationship that you had with your other siblings. You know, because it's one thing to to not grow with your parents. But it's also another thing to have siblings that, you know, you know they, they're your brothers, but some are, they're not really your brothers because you're more with your mom mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have to learn to love them as your siblings. Mm -hmm. Was that an issue or you just it was. ease into it? It was, it was. And, you know, what I was trying to explain, you know, was that, at four or five, I was trying to get my stepmother to love me. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, your mother will always be your mother. True. You know, not all mothers are good mothers, but I have a great mother. Mm. You know, and as bad as it's bad, I could not deny her and I could not leave her. You know, and I wanted her and I needed her. And I think at some point it was something my stepmother couldn't deal with. Um, and I talk about it in the book and I don't want to give away too much, but there came a crucial time where she forced me to choose. And I choose my mom, you know, um, and not even she forced me she, to choose. She kind of said I, I, I wasn't I was no longer welcome here at some point. Yeah, really? She did. How did that make you feel? Terrible. And how that related to my my siblings was that she also was feeding them a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, so from a young age, our house in Hampstead, the kitchen was not open. If we woke up, we would wait for her in case I put poison in the food. <gasps> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I talk a lot about this in the book. <laughs> Please give us, we'll see really good, but just give us some. This is TVT. Um, my siblings used to put a sign of cross. Um, when, when you're around. Yeah, in the, before, if they sat, sat where I'd sat, they would put sign of cross. Oh, the witch. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like Cinderella, but seriously, it was a little bit. I mean, it wasn't with the show. I wasn't a slave. I wasn't cleaning. You know, but, you know, but it, was, just it was child. registered. It was registered. Mm -hmm. My brother I was closest with. But hey, I will sit down and be playing PlayStation. We had PlayStation then, Nintendo 64. Mm. We would sit down and be playing this and he would have to drop it if someone walks in because he couldn't be seen to be that close with me. But secretly, we were very close. But he can't have his mom seeing me close with this girl that we don't the know. Outcast. Do you understand? You know, so it was, it was, it was weird. The relationship was very weird. Um, it was very traumatic. Um, my sister, we fought a lot, physical fight, a lot of physical fights. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, um, it was, it wasn't great. <laughs> it wasn't great. You know, I'm, I'm, I, you know me, I'm an Apoku. I, I want to dwell, <laughs> but let's, let's, <laughs> let's move, um, to your teenage years in London. Tell mm -hmm. me about growing up in London as a teenager, you know. From... It was, it was, I mean, it, it was, it was good, Tay. Um, like I said, from about the age of 14, I was no longer welcome with my dad. So I, I was now more with my mom. My school fees were still paid. I still got pocket money allowance. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't abandoned financially, but I was abandoned emotionally. Um, and so I suffered a lot of abandonment issues, mm. um, which also then started leading to this validation that I needed. People pleasing. Um, people pleasing, validation, wanting a community, wanting a family, trying to get your own family, looking for family in the wrong places. Yes. You know, and also there's a chapter in the book called The Endless Search for a Father Figure. Hmm. Looking for a father figure. You know, um, my my mom did remarry, but your dad is your dad, right? Yes. And um, my mom's my, my my mom's husband is my dad as well. But I I know my biological father, yes. right? You know, so there's only so much you can do to fill that void. So my he he even he even really fills it. <laughs> He's even my dad, and I love him. He's wonderful. But that doesn't mean somebody did not abandon you. And that doesn't mean as a teenage girl, you are still not wondering why. That doesn't mean that you're not still searching, you know, because the mind and human brain is not wired to be like, oh, well, I, I will replace. Mm -hmm. You will still feel abandoned. Mm -hmm. You will still wonder why you were abandoned. Yeah, you still want to answers to that. Thank you. There will still be answers. And even when it doesn't come, you keep searching. That's it. You know, so my teenage years, I would say, was filled with some wrong choices, especially wrong choices in friendships, wrong choices with men. Mm. You know, um, 18, 19, when we start dating, kind of looking for this, yeah. this thing that your dad did not do for you. Because I noticed that my friends, that their dad was, you are Presents. my princess. Yeah. <laughs> They knew who they were. Yes. <laughs> they were confident. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. nobody yes. could even teach them or tell them or coax them because they were solid. Do, you know? Do you know, Liz, that's one of the things that, you know, 
I got to a point in my life where I was I started envying people who had like families, father, mother together. Two parent household. I, I used I used to always say that, you know, the best thing that happened to me was my granny raising me. Although she was financially capable to, you know, to do the work. But now that I'm older, I'm just like, you know, there's so many things that I don't have that I keep looking for, that validation you're talking about. And I wish that, you know, I had the normal setting. Because I see kids that they were raised with their family, regardless of whatever life throws at them. There's still that thing where I know who I am. I can speak to my father. I can speak to my mother. You know, this was this is what my dad would have said in this situation. But people like us, we we be we have to figure out everything. That is it. It makes you make like some wrong choices. That is it. That is it. And you know, it's funny because my husband, um, he came from a two parent mm-hmm. home, and I don't by all means think that people who are in a two parent home means they have it all together yeah. or that the parents are the best parents. Yeah, of course. I don't think that. But what I do know is that, number one, there's no search because you have a mother and father figure and you are more balanced. I would say that at some point, because I was, after the detachment from my father and because I was so into a woman, I had a blurred version of, or vision of what man and woman Relationship should be. Should be. You know, my mom is so strong and so powerful. My granny is so powerful. You know, and what that meant was that I was showing up as an alpha female because I'm used to this woman who mm-hmm. is. And my mom is even very, very much yeah. like, we don't take nonsense. Yes, so what independent. Is this? Independent, yeah. mm-hmm. go get a fiery. We don't need the know? man. And I became that, that girl. Even more than herself, I would say. Because I think that with wisdom and because she's older, mm-hmm. the time she grew up in, she pulled you and reined you in. Yes. But with me, you know, if you reined me, <laughs> <laughs> I was or I was like, on yeah. Fire for fire. She she did. So and I had to relearn. There's a saying in Yoruba, Timmy said that Toba Bia Watu Tu Rebi, which basically people means you, you will give birth to yourself again, which means you relearn and mm. unlearn. And it's the hardest thing to do. To and that's learn. what I, I had to do. You know, I had to do with marriage, with my career, as a woman, as a human, you know, relearn myself, mm. you know, and face my traumas and put a mirror to my own face, which is very difficult. You know, it's painful it to is. look at yourself and say, this, this is, is who I am. This is why I'm doing this. This is what I need to fix. But those are things that I've done over the years. Mm. And that's why I wrote the book. I'm so proud. Um, let's talk about Liz Yamoja. Mm. They don't even know you have Liz Yamoja. <laughs> Liz Osho now is the CEO, the married woman. But let's talk about Liz Yamoja. Ah, Give Liz us the tea Yamoja. on Liz Yamoja. Liz Yamoja. Liz Yamoja. <laughs> because you know, when I, you know, when I started working for you, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I would hear people say, oh, Liz, Liz Yamoja has a PR company. I'm like, who's, who's, who's Liz, Liz Yamoja? Yamoja? Oh, I don't know Liz. <laughs> it's like, you had, you've, had you've, you've lived two different lives. I have. You've lived, I, I have. Liz Yamoja, now you're living Liz Osho. But please tell me about Liz Yamoja. So it's interesting because Liz Yamoja was like my stage name. I had a TV show, you know? I had a TV show. But before the TV show, on the advent of Facebook, you know, we all moved from High Five. We got this Facebook. I always used to have long hair. Mm-hmm. My hair would be all the way down here. Sleek. Remy Goddess. That was the name of the oh, brand. Oh, shit. Remy. I, I'd be like Goddess. That's aesthetic week. It was real. You know, it was so expensive. But I was working. I was earning good money. So I could afford it. It was oh, real. Human hair, long, 26 inches. I had you a city girl, a proper city girl. I was. I worked in recruitment, you know. And I had this friend, Deji, that every time he sees me, he'll say, yeah, more ja. Yeah, oh, more ja. Because of the hair. Right. You know, I had this um convertible BMW. And her G. Red, silver, red interiors. Uh-uh. I would, uh-uh. In London. I, of course now. <laughs> yeah. I had. I made one bad mistake, Timisa. My dad gave me 20,000 pounds. Ah! I, with that? My father gave me I mean, Liz, you don't have trauma. You've lived. <laughs> <laughs> Liz, I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg. My father gave me £20,000. I was supposed to put At it down time. on a house. I'm telling you. So that time, you can imagine what the equivalent is now. I was supposed to put it down in a house. I first buy convertible car. That was what <laughs> I did. You know, so I was flossing. I was, in fact, I was the girl that I wouldn't wait for a man to buy champagne. Let me go buy you ah! champagne. That was Liz Yamoja. You know, I would go into the club. I would buy the champagne. Yeah, I was living. You know, and I worked with a company, I'm sure you know them, called Kokoba. You know, Kokoba was then bringing people um, from from Nigeria Nigeria to artists. We we started with Basket Mouth. We did Dibanj. We did Wandeko, Mohits to Moshe. Mm -hmm. You know, we did a lot of um, those sort of things. And so that's how I got into TV. And because that, my friend was calling me Yamoja. 
I gave myself Lizzie and Maja. Love and it. so that's where the name came from. You know, and so I started doing television. Mm -hmm. I started, you know, interviewing these guys. And so there's nobody really from Tiwa to Wizkid to P Square that I hadn't interviewed at that time. And so I got a little bit of notoriety. Mm -hmm. I was notorious, yeah. you know, and I moved to Nigeria to go out to come and blow fully. But Nigeria showed me, eh? <laughs> okay, let's, let's talk about moving back to... So first of all, the decision to move from all of that, um, well, let's say you were secure. I mean, it was money, mm -hmm. your dad was okay, mm -hmm. but you decided to come back to Nigeria after mm -hmm. living so long in the, in the UK. Mm -hmm. Why, first of all? Heartbreak. So I'd broken up with someone. I was really, really depressed. Um, and the thing about England is it's, it's all well and good, but there's a glass ceiling. Yeah. And I can say that confidently now that I live in the United States mm -hmm. because there's an American dream and it's real. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people blow in America. I'm not saying people can't do well in England, but I feel like there's, there's more so of a glass yeah. ceiling. And that I, I, I already at 28, because I moved back here at 28, mm. could see that there was only so far I could go. Right. You know, as a black woman, you know, and as somebody who wanted to pursue media. Right. I had this love of media. And so I moved back with my heartbreak. I remember I didn't even move out of my house. I just packed two suitcases. My mom moved out. She bought a truck, like a small van, put all my things in the van and sent that van, shipped it to Nigeria shipped it to me in 1000. What was it? I just was sad. I was sad. You know the thing about England is that it's gloomy. Yeah. You know the weather, the weather you know, you know we'll be really taking like bus. Mm. You'll be taking you know you can die in England and nobody, nobody would know. know. Yes. Until your body starts smelling. I, you know, Lisa, I, I, There's no community. You know I've been wanted to say but I didn't want to say so I did they don't, don't know, crucify you. not give me work because I really want to work in London as well. Right. But I didn't really like London. Mm. I was like, that in London with this. Mm. I can't live there ever yeah. again. I'm, I, I'll say that. They, they can't make me live there. Nobody, nothing can make me live there. Not amount of money. I like sun. Yeah. I like community, you know, and London's felt like suffering after yeah. a while for me. I felt like I was suffering. I was not happy. And so I moved here to be a TV presenter. But life took a different, <laughs> a different turn. Tell me, tell me about um, because so when you moved back, you you started working for Genevieve, right? I the did. magazine. I did. But the plan was to always be on TV. So the plan was to be on TV, and I actually asked Genevieve to interview me as Lizzie Moja now, as mm -hmm. the big star yes, from now. London. But they it didn't come through. So instead, you know, while I was chasing them to say, how come you guys haven't interviewed me? They said that their online manager had just quit. And it, had, it was now four months. I'd been here. The money my dad gave me was dwindling. You know, Lagos mm -hmm. is not cheap. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. especially when you're living a baby I, a girl life. Just came back from London. I was, having, to... I was having tea here, there, and yeah, everywhere. Lunch, having, brunch. Do you understand? Brunches. And the money was finishing. So yeah. I just said, well, I think I'm good at social media. You know, I've amassed the following for myself. Yeah. I felt like I could help you guys. And, they, you know, they said, come and interview on Friday. I think this was Thursday. I interviewed on Friday. I started on Monday. And the rest is history. I ended up helping Genevieve build their online presence and actually being some sort of PR mm. girl I didn't realize we that, didn't call it that but that was essentially was what I was yeah. you know um because I was in charge of all the events any summer party I Genevieve Mrs. Irabot took me like this yeah like her daughter so Genevieve really helped mold my life in Lagos you know and I was I gave her my time four years I dedicated but Genevieve also gave me a lot and Mrs. Irabot gave me a lot um, and yeah, I, 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 I thrived. I really thrived. I really enjoyed Lagos as bad as Lagos can be. You know, it is a fantastic place to grow. Yeah. It's a fantastic place to, to be, um, to network, as well. to network. Um, opportunities are amazing. And I couldn't have gotten what I got. I don't think I would have set up so me in London the way it's yeah. established yeah. here. Yeah. I don't think I would have worked with yeah. the brands that I work with now if yeah. I was still in London. But, you know, Liz, like, coming from the background you're coming from, right, you had no background in PR. I didn't. So what gave you the confidence to say, you know what, I'm going to start so many solutions and going to be a PR agency? If I don't mention my husband now, he'll watch this thing and say, he didn't him. give me my credit. <laughs> so he was part of the reason. He actually was really, um, he was like, you're doing well. You know, you do well and you're so passionate. I had already started doing stuff in the, on the side. Um, for you know, people. for people, people were calling. There's like solo phones. They wanted some sort of activation. Mm, remember solo phones? Yeah, yeah. So oh I my god! With solo phones. You know, then another one of my clients, God rest his soul, Kayade Farm. He wanted to do some sort of thing. 
we needed Dakore. Because of Genevieve, I had all these people's Contact. numbers. Yeah. So I was able to call Dakore for him. Zena Balogun. I was able to say, another person that's quite fit is Zena Balogun. Why don't we consider her? Mm -hmm. I called Zena Balogun. You know, I made the intro and we were doing production. Again, I didn't know that I was doing production, but that was what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But to, after we produce the, you know, content, they needed to spread it. Mm -hmm. So they would be like, okay, but where are we going to amplify this? Mm. I didn't realize it was PR, but I would call Bella Niger yeah. and I would say, oh, I know Bella Niger. Bella Niger can post it. Okay, Linda Ikeji can post it. There's even one called Stella, even though, Stella it's, <laughs> even though it's gossip, but I think that yeah. a lot of people read that blog, you know? And so it, that was how I was amplifying because every time we created content, we needed to amplify. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so it, it began. And before you know it, you know, people want newspapers. And then, I'm okay, this day I'm having to figure out, you know, who the call, biggest, yeah. you know, um, journalists are, the biggest platforms are. And that was where I realized that, okay, I'm doing PR. And so friends were the ones saying to me, Liz, you realize this is what you're doing. You're doing PR. You realize this is PR and that you're good at it. I was like, eh, it's PR. Okay. And I'm good at it. Okay. You know you can do events. And so even Solo then had an event and we're like, okay, who are the famous people that are going to come? We didn't even have influence. We didn't call it influencing Just them. celebrities. I'll say, okay, don't worry. Juliette Ibrahim is around and I mm -hmm. think she likes me. I'll DM her. Mm -hmm. This person, Osas follows me. I would tell her to it's come. relationships. And so I started like, and that was how it was. And before you knew it, my husband literally was like, why don't you do this for yourself? Set up a proper company, you know? And, were you scared? And I did. To start? Mm, I wasn't. Because if you have been really, I if you feel it. So. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't. You know why? Number one, I had a husband now that was going to make sure I ate and I had a roof over my head. <laughs> so even if bad as bad, bad, I see the marriage. Eat. I will eat and I will have a house because he was paying the rent and he was giving me food, you know, or at least food was in the house. Yeah. So it was okay to take a risk, you know. It was a calculated risk that was not going to leave me homeless or depressed, like where I was coming from, from London. Mm. So I said, you know what, let me give this my my gusto and I think he, he also really helped to just give me the encouragement that I need because you know Tay it's about encouragement and the, what you're hearing in your ears mm -hmm. especially for somebody like me I don't know about you you know it's who I'm surrounding myself with mm -hmm. that, is giving, that, me, as well, like that is giving me that is giving me you know fuel energy see. what are you hearing what are you consuming what are people telling you and at that time when I just got married it was Mrs. B my mentor Ola Balogun it was my husband you know, and always my mom that has been steadfast that was saying I would bounce ideas if I want to do this, I want to do that. And it's so funny that even though Mrs. B was in the same space as me, she gave me her shoulders to Shout stand to on, you know. Yeah. I remember I would do more bows and tell her to come. She will come where she can to support and be the celebrity face. Mm -hmm. At least she's a celebrity PR yeah, person, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and, and I just grew and grew. And the industry supported me, mm. you know. Girls Day, girls yes, stood for yes, me, yes. you know. I'm just trying to think of names then. Beverly Naya, they mm. would come to my things. You know, I would say, okay, I'm now working with Sweet Kiwi. They would, all, they would all fall through. Mm. Timini, mm. you know, and that's Jemima Osude. They would all come. They weren't the big stars now. Mm -hmm. they, they too, they were just starting. Yeah. But we all started together and everybody supported each other. Oh, okay. But now they want one million. <laughs> to even <laughs> One million? <laughs> they want one million to even talk to you now, uh, to take the call. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. No, but you also had a very interesting... Like, some is eight years now. We're eight years this year. I remember... I joined, what year did I join? Oh, uh, like what year did three you years? join? Three years? Yeah, you were about three years. Yeah. yeah. So five years ago, you were yeah. a star. And you know... How I've, did you join? Okay, so... <laughs> I forgot. How did you know tea. about Sumi? So, you know, say... I don't need to do social media already. I was already coming up. Like, I was like, maybe I'm... You had TV 10K tea. or 12K followers. And you know, say I resigned for that former work. What mm -hmm. I need to... Things not they easy. <laughs> I can't go collect work as P with Vaughn. Remember Vaughn? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but in my, in my head, I, yeah, Vaughn. I loved Vaughn, but I just like, you know, there's more to me than being an assistant, right? You know, I'd already worked in comms before and I needed somewhere to, you know, grow. And at the time, you were doing South African tourism. Mm, you, now, that's you, South Africa. Yes. You came to my office with Efetomi. In Wole Latitude's Crescent. With, with their faithful Yes, that time yeah. you were sharing an office. Of, I, don't, I don't know you were sharing. It was one, one building, yes. And that time, I was out of a job, mm. but I was already popping on social media. But I did not want to be out of a job because I, because I, didn't, I wasn't sure what social media was going to right, do. Right, right, right. So I think I, I came to you and said, you know, I want to work with you. You say, ha, I know if you pay you, you don't do I say, don't worry, we'll be I'll rough. I'll just do it, I'll yeah. just do it. But you, you didn't accept until much later. You accepted when you had, you took on um, 
Oge started. Um, he took on what's this place on Admiralty Way that this person's husband owns. He took on two new clients and you needed somebody to help you I for a month. Oh, wow. So, I can't even remember. Yes, yeah, so I remember. Let me, let, me, let me do stuff at that time. I remember. So I came to, so you now called me up and said, do you still want this job? I have it for just a month. <laughs> and that time, I said, ah, if I think I leave this job after a month, I might twist. <laughs> I but you didn't tell there. me. But you didn't I, I, tell I, I me. I'm going to tell you, you're going to lowball me. If I tell you, you're going to price me less. <laughs> I say, ah, because I think you were paying me 120 at the time. That was big money because where I'm coming from, you know, you know, say, hmm, 120 was big and for the comms person, it was huge. And you weren't even full time because this boy I was three times negotiated. Three, but I had a career. Yeah, I had it. You did. You side, did. But you did. I wasn't sure about it. So to be safe, I wanted to also build myself and work. Smart. Yeah, work under you. And I think one of the things that I would say thank you for is that, you know, I saw the celebrity, the scene from the back end. I worked from the back end to say, okay, now so you do good. Now so this is where you should be. Mm. Certain kind of places you should be. This is mm. how you should position. Mm. And you strategy. Know. And strategy. I learned a lot of strategy. Just even being in that space, I knew too many things. So by the time I was ready for my own career, I was equipped. I didn't mm -hmm. know. You knew even what brands want to hear. Yes. You knew what sp sponsorship was going. You would be in those rooms. Uh -uh, did yeah. we not go to Unilever so we many went, times? We went every brand we seen. <laughs> we like so when I when I switched to being Timisan, mm -hmm. people were like oh, I already know him you now. So know you know him. I already yeah. had relationships yeah. that I could leverage. In fact, on. I would go after a while, like mm -hmm. after you had been with me for a year, we mm -hmm. would go to some companies yeah. and then they would be like, "TV, it's yeah. like a celebrity yeah. came." TV, so that's when things started. You know when when I was already doing so many solutions. TVT was growing to the yeah. point where they were bouncing off each other. I could use some of the cloud from TVT to get into rooms. It was just perfect. Can I tell you what I loved about having you? Number one, it was funny. You know, mm -hmm. I was going through infertility. I'm not sure if you knew or I knew how you much had you knew. Issues, but, you know. but like, it was nice to come into the office because we had an office. Guys, mm -hmm. this office had like 12 people so all in one room. Very tight corner. Very tight corner, but mm -hmm. everybody had their desks. Mm -hmm. I had the biggest desk, yes, obviously, yes. as the ogre. But you were funny. You know, and I would laugh. And we had our own little bond. And I'm sure mm -hmm. everybody would be doing Yimu for us yeah. because we would go to the gym together. Or yeah. I would be on my way to the gym. You would say, drop me. Mm -hmm. I would take you to lunches. Yeah. I know they take oh, anybody no, else no, to lunch. No, I was Liz's pet. I, you uh, were my pet. She was, he was teacher's they, they pet. They knew that they did, like I was so close to Liz. Yeah. They, they used to send me to Liz. Yeah. <laughs> so I liked also, though, on a work, you helped my company grow. Mm. You really helped. I, on a work, you did your work. Mm -hmm. You know, you had access. Could I call Toke? I know Toke, but can I call Toke yeah. to do anything mm. for me? But literally, I would be able to put Toke on a flyer because you had made that call and yeah. Toke is in Toke now. Yeah. Anything to miss and wanted, she would do. You know, and which helped with my, my brand. A lot of the relationships that we have now and that we've been able to leverage. When we got Disney, Wakanda Forever, mm. Shabi, we used Bio mm -hmm. for the invite. Yeah. I don't know Bio. Mm. I know Bio through you. Yeah. Steve Chooks. So many celebrities, yeah. influencers, mm. You helped connect. So I want to say thank you for being diligent. Because as you worked from <laughs> us. Dollars. I just thank you. <laughs> as you worked for us, you know, mm. um, as, we, or as we worked for you, mm -hmm. you also worked for yeah. us. Yeah. You know, it, was it, was it was a great relationship. It was a great relationship. It was a great relationship. Let's talk about infertility. Mm. You know, for you to, for you saying this now makes more sense. Because I knew that there was stuff you were going through, but you, you were always showing up at work as if nothing. I knew there was something off, but like you were always showing up as if nothing was happening at the time. Mm. But I knew that you had been married for a while. Obviously, a baby, you needed a baby, but the baby wasn't present, mm. right? It was, I knew after the fact that you were always looking. Tell me about that journey, you know, having gotten married and expecting yourself to just, expecting to just have a baby, mm. your career is, things are going well, but mm. where's the baby? Where's the baby? Where's the baby? Yeah. You know, it's funny because the, the book... The and book, after a while, Nigerians can be Nigerians. Like, yeah. ah, it's that far. Yeah. They'll ask the... you. Even, even like, parents, friends, you know, they'll ask you, like, what's going on, you know? And are you stressed? Are you too much into work? You know, are you even having sex? Because mm. at this point, it's maybe you, you are just partying. Sex that Because you're going work. to, you know? They're asking you, like, are you sure you're doing this? Or because I saw you posting one thing for one client. Are you sure you're not into work too much? Or how do you get pregnant when you're in South Africa? Maybe she works with South African tourism. She's in South Africa. I remember Africa. those conversations. And they used to always get to you because, you know, people thought that you carried the work on your head so much that you didn't have time to. I didn't have time for, for the home. But it was funny because it, the, 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 the truth couldn't be further. You know, it couldn't be further from the truth. And I, 
had wanted, my husband and I, we had wanted to be pregnant by our white wedding. You know, now, trad, December, mm -hmm. our white wedding was the next year. We had this plan, but, you know, they say you plan, but God has a okay. bigger plan. Mm -hmm. And it was really painful, um, Tunisa, to be wanting something so bad, and it was just never there. It eludes you to be spending a lot of so means money, a lot of money. Every time you went on IVF, IVF is crazy. It will consume you emotionally and it will take all your money. You know, and at the time we were doing okay, but we weren't, I wasn't a multimillionaire. Yeah. You know, so a round of IVF at uh, five, six, seven million is plenty profits. Yes. <laughs> you know, work, it's, yeah. it's 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 what you use to buy designer bags. Yes. <laughs> but I was not buying designer bags, I was spending it on drugs and trying to get this baby. It it was consuming. Um and I had a choice to make. Either I let it consume me and I became depressed, or I would cry, which I would often cry. Do you know how many times I would cry in the car before I enter? Remember my driver, Uche? He saw the worst of it. I would cry because they've called me and they've said this IVF didn't work. This round of IVF didn't work. They would call me and say, we got two eggs, but one is not good. Let's see by tomorrow if the other one will be work working. And I literally am on my way to work when I'm getting a call saying, Mrs. Oshaw, I'm sad to say I have bad news. Mrs. Oshaw, are you sitting down? I want to tell you. Almost like someone passed. And each time it felt, it felt like I was grieving. I would yeah. grieve. I was grieving my fertility. I was grieving for this loss of something that I didn't even have. And I wanted this baby. And it was affecting everything, affecting how I would show up. You know, to be honest, I look back and I think that some of my tantrums, even at work, I can just be angry. I know. And it would be because of this thing, yes. this other thing. I didn't allow me to be fully present. Mm -hmm. I was present, but I wasn't yes. fully present. Yes. I wasn't my happiest self. Yes. I was very sad, yes. you know. And um, it was intense. But I had to choose to show up. And so, yes, I think I, after a while, did let work consume me. Like, at least if I know half child, I would, be, I would be a badass PR girl, you know? I, I, I allowed work to consume me. And remember my 35th birthday? Oh. It was, that was what I used to really console myself. Yes. So I would party, I would drink, and people would calm. Mm. Because if I don't have this baby, let me have something to be happy about. Do you know what the gag is? Mm. With, I remember me and um, this baby walking on, on the birthday and everything. I had no idea that you were going through this. Yudara, I just had a loss, actually. I had just had like a, well, not loss, I, but a failed cycle. We call yeah. it a failed cycle. I had just had a failed cycle. Please tell me about this. How does a cycle work? Because, you know, give me, give me context. Because, you know, I hear this thing where you say, oh, my IVF failed and, you know, women are traumatized. Mm -hmm. if, for people that don't understand it, how mm -hmm. does this cycle work? Okay, the first thing that we want to know is that a man produces sperm every day. Right. You just eat and you produce another new set of sperm. Yeah. You're not born with sperm. Right. You create it. Right. A woman is born with her lifetime supply of eggs. So from when I was in my mother's womb, I had my eggs. Which meant when my grandmother was pregnant with my mom, I was already there somewhere. Mm. Because I was in my mom. Remember, I'm an egg from my mom. Right. Right. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because I'm born with my lifetime supply of eggs, for whatever reason, some of us, our eggs are not as surplus. So my issue was actually like an egg issue, right? And the cycle means they need to get sperm and they need to get egg and it needs to fuse. And then they do that outside in a lab. That's mm -hmm. why it's called IVF, in vitro. Mm -hmm. And then they put it inside you. So because of that, there's so many variables because the sperm must be good. The egg must be good. They must meet. They must, you know, fuse. Yeah. They must become an embryo. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, they have to divide. Yeah. And then that embryo must come inside you. Your body must accept it. Because oftentimes, people's bodies don't even accept it. They may, your body would think it's a foreign object. That's not how God intended oh. for us to. You're supposed to have sex with a woman and then yeah. it happens. So the fact that something is being placed in you, oftentimes the, the egg may not even stay. So, that is a whole cycle. And for them to remove eggs from you, remember that is not natural. It is something that the doctors are inducing. Yeah, yeah. You must take injections. It's a whole thing. It, the process is like a seven, eight week process. From you taking injections mm -hmm. to prep you to have many mm -hmm. eggs. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have your period as a woman, one egg gets released. Yeah. But when you do IVF, they want more than one egg. Yeah. They're hoping for surplus eggs yeah. so that they can harvest those eggs. Mm -hmm. 
and they can put the sperm with the eggs in a petri dish in a lab and then put it back inside. So that's what we do. And that process is expensive. And that process is emotional. And I've done that process five times. Does that make you feel like inadequate? Stop asking the question. You don't fight with God. Mm. You say, God, you must eat me. You must eat me because, you know, you're making me suffer. You know, you're making me suffer. You're for making, something that people get. Yeah, for something that people get so easily. You know, um, and it's such a task for me. It's so draining emotionally, physically, spiritually. Babe, I, I went to God. I had to go to God. At the time where the year that I had my, I, I got pregnant with my son. There's no church I had not been to. I had seen Nathaniel Bassi <laughs> face to face. He had prayed for me. I had gone to sorting out. You know, I was part of Cornerstone. I was part of Cornerstone. Four o'clock. I was with every day. For two years, actually four o'clock every day, I wake up to join the prayer. I was in the prayer line. You know, because you, I was searching. I was like, God, I need you to show up. 